Alright, so this is the beginning of lab number four recording. We're going to go over several things in this lab session. So, um, I'd like to make sure that you're taking notes so that you can keep a good record of the process that we go through. Um, that way when you get to the machines, you're going to actually have an outline with good description of what's needed to do. If you take this lab in person, you're still going to have to go through the lecture portion or at least the demonstration portion to get released to the machines and be able to do the project under supervision. Um, but this actually gives you kind of a head start. So one of the things that, the first thing that we're going to want to go over today is on our last lab, what we did was facing operations on the lathe. And on two of those components, drawings number five and 11, both have chamfers. Now what a chamfer is, is an angular cut, or a heavy deburr, if you will, on the corners, on the ends and on the corners of those cylinders. Now the call out is two by 30 thousandths by 45 degrees. So the two just means that it's on both ends. The 30 thousandths is the dimension of both the vertical and the horizontal leg, not the hypotenuse. It's important that you understand that it does not represent the hypotenuse. Even on a 30 degree angle, you have to specify which leg is which for your dimension. But what we're doing here today is going to be a 45 degree. Now, yeah, last lab, what we did was talked about tolerancing. And we're going to talk about tolerancing quite a bit throughout these lab series on video. But that 30 thousandths, now I don't have it drawn up here, but you can refer to your part drawings in front of you. If you look at drawing number 11, it should show you that the tolerance for a two-place decimal, so 0 0.03, that's two digits after the decimal point, that's a two-place decimal, should give you a plus or minus 10 thousandths tolerance. And for those still trying to get caught up with the, the way that machinists and engineers in the machine shop speak, that's a 0 .01 plus or minus tolerance. Okay? So that means I can be as big as 40 thousandths and as small as 20 thousandths. Now if I took a part and on one end I made it 20, and I can pretty closely within a couple of thousandths get that, and on the opposite end, make it 40 thousandths by 45, the two ends are gonna look significantly different because this is such a small part. On a really big part, a 30 thousandths by 45 chamfer, it's not very noticeable, but you're gonna see a big difference. So if I have a tolerance very similar to if I have a bullseye and I'm trying to shoot either a gun or a bow and arrow, what am I going to aim for? Now, if I don't think about aiming high because the gravity pulls it down and all this other stuff, what I want to hit is the center of the target or the bullseye. I'm not aiming to hit the outside corners. I'm aiming to hit the center of the bullseye. So what we're going to do when we're manufacturing parts is we're going to shoot for the center of the tolerance zone. That gives you error above and below. Now once these tolerances get much tighter, it's going to be even more critical that you shoot for the center. Okay? So we have to think about how we're going to set up the machine to be able to put the chamfer on. Now I have drawn up here our workpiece, right here. This is just a simulation of what the chuck jaws would look like around the part. I have it drawn really big so that you can see it. One thing that I don't have drawn on there is the little chamfer or 
deburred radius that you may have machined on the part with the file. And that's going to account for a small portion of that 30 degrees, but we're still going to shoot for 30. If you remember in lab number three, I said, don't file so much that you actually file a feature on the part. I wouldn't want to file a groove in the part. I wouldn't want to take a file and file the end and make it at an angle any more than I'd want to file a huge radius because that's going to affect our ability to be able to put an accurate chamfer on that corner. Okay? On item number five, item number five later on, and I believe in the next lab, you're going to actually do the threading on that piece. So when we start cutting the threads on it, most of that chamfer goes away. But the reason for the chamfer is so that our die, the tool that we use to cut ex external threads, has a place for it to kind of lead in and get started on that drill rod. And remember, drill rod is our annealed tool steel. So when I start calculating RPM, that's what we're going to be wanting to look at. So we've got this part. I've drawn in our tool post. After this time, you probably won't see me put in the dovetail holder and the tool post with the nut. All I'm going to use is my lathe tool as a simulation of what that tool is actually going to look like. Okay? So I'm going to take for granted that you understand that this lathe tool represents this tool right here. Okay? It's important that you see that. So I'm going to go ahead and erase that because we have that understanding at this point. Okay? Now, there's several ways that I can cut a 45 degree chamfer. One of the ways is we use a compound feed. That's the axis that we have set parallel to the z-axis or the carriage direction. We use that to feed in our 10,000 increments for facing. You can unbolt that axis and rotate it. There's actually a dial on the base so that you can set it accurately to an angular dimension or rotation to the center line of the spindle. Okay. Now, that seems very labor intensive for us to work that direction or to do that much work to try to set up a chamfer that the chamfer only is a lead in for a thread or it's only a lead in to get pressed into the other parts of your crankshaft. Some of that goes away later and you're gonna see that as this series goes forward. So we're not going to put a lot of effort into getting that 45 degrees set up perfectly. In all reality, we could go back into the drawings and say, okay, that, that angle, if you look at the tolerance, shows me that I have a half a degree tolerance. We could probably set that angle up to be plus or minus two or three degrees, and we're still doing everything that's expected of us for the final assembly of the air motor, okay? Now what I can do, right, I can manipulate this tool. But for starters, if I set the tool up the way I would with a facing operation, I'd want to make sure if I have an imaginary x-axis line, an imaginary z-axis line, that there's an angle here and angle here, right? Because the only thing that's going to put the finish on is going to be the tip of that tool. Now this is not terribly critical on the rotation for this because we're going to move it again. But in order to use my scale trick, if you recall from last lab, I pinched the scale between the tip of the tool and the outside cylinder of the workpiece and then I looked at how vertical that scale was to determine whether the tip of the tool was on the center line of the workpiece. 
we have to have the tool in this orientation in order for that to work. If the tool is tipped like this, I'm not pinching between the tip of the tool and the cylinder. I'm pinching between the heel of that angle and the cylinder. That's going to give me a false reading of the center line relationship between the tip of the tool and the workpiece. So make sure that I have my tool post rotated in such an orientation that I actually get an accurate center line when I'm doing that scale trick. Okay? So I believe we've got that. We do our scale trick. We set up center line of the tool relationship to the workpiece, or more importantly, the center line of the spin, because that's really what we care about, is where the part rotates about. The leading edge of the tool has roughly about a three-eighths of an inch length if you ground your tool accurately. And that's represented right up here on the tip. That's where there's a positive rake angle or a high shear so that the material flows real nicely across that tool. We could actually rotate the tool this way, right? So that the angle here to here is 45 degrees. Now I have the leading edge of the tool set to the proper angle at 45 degrees to cut that chamfer. Now you can't see it here, but geometrically that doesn't work because the tool, the block or the tool post is so big that I'm gonna run into the chuck jaws. That's a problem, okay? So what we can do is rotate the tool post so that this angle is 45 degrees, right? So we're going to get rid of that guy. So the relationship of the leading edge of the tool to the center line of the spindle is 45 degrees. Now if I look at my drawing, that's what we actually want, correct? If I look at the center line of the workpiece, down through the center, to the angle that we want to cut, that's 45 degrees. So we've actually set up the machine properly to cut that chamfer. So there's a couple extremely important steps that we have to take. Number one, all we're going to do for now is cut that chamfer. So, when we're back here setting up our tool center line, if I had a choice, this is with the scale trick, if I had a choice whether the tool was going to be a little bit too high or a little bit too low, I would always err on the lower side. Because if we're on the high side and the relief angle isn't great enough, you're actually plowing and moving material. So you're displacing it as opposed to actually cutting it or machining it, okay? So I prefer for it to be a bit low. So that's really number one key when we set up for this chamfering operation. Number two, obviously, is to set the 45 degrees, correct? Now we're going to look at the part drawing. The part drawing tells us that the material is drill rod. Now we learned in lab three that drill rod is a needle tool steel. Well, a needle tool steel with a high speed steel tool bit 
has a cutting speed of 50. So cutting speed equals 50. It's important that you understand what units that number is in. If you don't understand it, don't remember it, you better write this down. So 50 is in S, F, P, M. What does that stand for? Surface feet per minute. Okay? We talked about that yes, yesterday, or lab number three, if you will. 50 is in surface feet per minute. So if I had a way of measuring how much distance of that cylinder went past, in a minute's time, it would be 50 linear feet. Now the equation that we've derived to get you to an RPM, because cutting speed doesn't tell you anything about rotations per minute or RPM. So the RPM equals Cutting speed times four, and all that over the diameter, the diameter that you cut. Now we can get our calculators out or we can round some numbers so that it's easy for us to do. Our diameter of this workpiece is 187 and a half thousandths, or three sixteenths of an inch in diameter. Okay? I said we can round within 10%, I'm happy with that. So we're going to round 0.1875 to 0 0.2, or 200 thousandths. Well, if I come over here and do the math on the top, 550 times 4 is 200, right? Divided by 0.2. I get a pretty easy answer. I can do that in my head. So that's a thousand RPM. All right, thousand RPM. So we're going to run the spindle at a thousand RPM. We calculate that off of the major diameter or the biggest diameter that we're going to cut. Everything else is going to be a little bit slower than that in surface speed. And that's going to be safer for our tool to be able to survive throughout the cut. Okay? So once we have our tool set up, we know how fast we're going to run, we're going to change our gearbox, right? We change the gearbox on a geared head machine, this is on the safety test. We change the gears in a gearbox while the machine is not running. If you're driving your car down the road, you don't shut the engine off to change gears. But when you dump the clutch, what you have done is engage the synchronizers. The synchronizers keep these gears going at the same speed so that when they come together, you're not clashing and banging gears together. Well, on an engine lathe, there are no synchronizers. So if I try to change the gears while the machine's running, you're going to hear a bunch of crashing and slashing and banging of these gear teeth into each other. You may end up having pieces fall off. You're going to beat the gears up. So it's important that you understand that you only change the speed on a gear head machine while the machine or the spindle is not running. Okay? So we're going to set it, I think, that we set it to 840 RPM because we said if I'm going to error, I'm going to error on the low side so I don't burn up my tool. Now the other RPM choice that we had was 1,050 RPM. You're still within that 10% that I allow, so we could run at the 1050 and I wouldn't have an issue with that. Once we get all this set up, you recall, I moved the carriage with the big hand wheel, but it's a very coarse increment on its dial. So we're going to just roughly position it. We're going to roughly position that tool right at the corner. 
I want the leading edge of the tool to consume the entire section of that 30 thousandths by 45 degrees. Once you get to the machine and we actually demonstrate that, it's going to be more obvious to you. Okay? What's another key factor when we're on the back side of the spindle? So when we're on the front side, we push that lever down so that we have a certain direction of rotation. Now if I'm on the front side of the spindle, I'm running in what I'm going to call the normal rotation. Okay? Normal rotation is something you're going to find on the, on the safety test. That's important for you to remember that term. Normal rotation. So in order to get normal rotation, I take that lever on the side and I push it down. Now the spindle is rotating towards me. But with the tool on the back side, if the material is rotating towards me, I'm actually bringing material up on the bottom side, right, of the cutting tool. The cutting tool doesn't want to cut that way. All it wants to do is smush the material out of the way as it's running. You're going to turn it blue, you're going to heat treat the material, and you're going to destroy your tool. So that means that I want to be the opposite of normal rotation. So yesterday we said normal rotation is clockwise from the motor end of the spindle. Well in this case I want to be the opposite of that. So I'm going to be running counterclockwise from the motor end of the spindle. When we're cutting our chamfers on these two components, number five, and number 11 is the only chance or the only opportunity in this lab series that you're going to run reverse rotation, backwards rotation, counterclockwise from the motor end of the spindle. Okay? So it's important that you remember that. Once we get the machine set up, we've got the RPM set, we're going to start the spindle. So we're going to take that lever on the side and pull up. When we pull up, it's going to be running the proper rotation. I've got my carriage locked in. So that's the big lock on the top of the carriage. Now I'm going to take my small compound feed because that compound is set parallel to the z-axis or parallel to the center line of the spindle, which is really what I care about, right? Or the ways of the machine. So now I'm going to turn this little hand wheel until the leading edge of the tool just starts. You're going to feed nice and slow because I have better control of it. Nice and slow until I just see a chip curl. And then I'm going to stop. Leave the machine running. I'm going to take that dial on the hand wheel and set it to zero. Okay? When I set it to zero, that's my baseline for this 30 thousandths dimension. Okay? So if I reference it on my drawing, That's actually the dimension that I'm controlling, the z-axis. So now that I have my zero set, I want to make sure that I have some cutting oil available. I'm going to put some cutting oil on there. As the machine or spindle is running, I'm going to feed in 30 thousandths. It's going to be generating that chamfer. If while you're feeding in, I'm not seeing nice curled chips, your tool height has probably got a problem, or you're running in the wrong direction. Make sure your lever is pulled up. If you have a problem with it cutting metal or it curling a nice chip, stop, get one of us and we can help you, okay? Your tool may be a little bit too high, we can adjust that down while we're sitting right where we're at. In most cases, it's gonna be cutting very nicely. So I'm going to feed in 30 thousandths and I'm going to back it back off. Once I back it back off, you're going to see 
that your 30 thousandths chamfer is complete. So one out of the four chamfers that you have to machine is done. Now because we're sitting at a 45, the included angle between the length of the piece and the chamfer is 135 degrees. 135 degrees, as long as you have a sharp tool and it is set either at or below center your tool height, you're going to have a nice clean cut. There should not be any burrs, remember B-U-R-R-S, any burrs that are produced. If you have a slight burr and it feels sharp, you can take your fingernail and it kind of catches on the edge of it. Go ahead and move your carriage back, start your spindle, and use your file just to touch that burr off of there. Once you get rid of the burrs, if it's a significant burr, again, get one of ours help, and we can help figure out why it gave you a really bad burr. If it turned blue, we've got other issues. Get one of our help, help or assistance, okay? Now that we've got one done, and we've got your tool height adjusted if we need to, you've got three more chamfers to cut. While you're set up, now it's time to get those knocked out. Now, lab three, we machine three different components. Five, six, and 11. Number six is a piston, and that's the quarter inch diameter. The one quarter of an inch diameter, or 250 thousandths diameter, does not require a chamfer on those corners. If you cut a chamfer on the edges of your piston, you get to practice again. You get to go hacksaw another piece, face another piece to length, and not chamfer the next one because you've ruined the part. Okay? It may run, but it's not the specification. These drawings, as a machinist, are my contracts. If you don't make something that looks like this, and then measures the dimensions with the tolerances, guess what? The guy that wants them doesn't have to pay for them. And if he doesn't have to pay for them, your boss is going to eventually come over to you and say, you know, that last job that you just made 500 parts of, we didn't get paid for because you made them wrong. You're probably not going to be there very long. Okay? That's part of what our job is. If we don't make good parts that measure quality dimensions within the tolerances, we don't need to get paid. That's our job requirement, okay? So you're going to do four chamfers, all right? Once you do those four chamfers, roughly about half of the work is done for lab number four. Okay, so now we have all four of our chamfers done on parts number five and 11. And we're gonna move on to the crank component. Now, if you recall when you were drawing these parts in a previous semester, the crankshaft is made up of three components. The main shaft that actually spins in the body, and then there's a disc. That disc, holds the shaft and the offset pin together. So that disc is actually in drawing on sheet number eight. So I'd like for you to take and pull up item number eight in your drawings. You should have that in front of you. We're going to be learning quite a few new tools in this section of lab number four. Okay, so there's going to be a fair amount of note taking that you should, you should be ready for. The first thing I want to look at, and we already had said in a previous, a previous session, is that we have to figure out what material we're going to use. So the type of the material is CRS. Well, I have to know what CRS stands for, correct? And CRS stands for cold rolled steel. 
So cold rolled steel is going to be the material that we cut. If I go back to that sheet of paper that we had earlier on in one of the lab sessions, this is the information, and don't be concerned if you didn't see that, but this is this is the sheet that's hanging up in the front of the MEGR 2156 lab area. And that gives you your suggested cutting speeds. Remember, we have two columns, one of high-speed steel and one of carbide. And then we've got a list of materials, and we have to figure out what the cutting speed is. So before we get too far along, let's figure out what that is. We've got a material of CRS, cold rolled steel. Cold rolled steel is also referred to as low carbon steel. Low carbon steel means that the carbon content is low enough that if I want to heat treat this material, I have to introduce something else into the heat treatment process. Okay? When your carbon content is really, really low, it's hard to get a real good hardness out of it unless you add something to that. Okay, um, one of the things you can add to it is called case knit. It's a powder material, and as you heat it up, this case case knit adds to the carbon content of the material. So it's important that you understand. And low carbon steel or coal rolled steel is generally what's considered a free machining steel. Okay, it's a, it's a little bit easier to machine. So my cutting speed is going to be a bit higher. Well, my cutting speed for cold rolled steel is 100. Now, what's the units that my cutting speed is in? It's in surface feet per minute. Okay? I want you to remember that. So if I look at this drawing, the first thing I have to figure out is what stock am I going to use? We have a whole pile of little bits of material that we saw cut on lab session number one. Do any of those materials fit into what's required? Well, one of the pieces that we cut was a one inch diameter slug of steel. It's called rope steel. Five eighths of an inch long. We chamfered both ends of it already got that ready but it's quite a bit bigger than what we care about the part finishing to so we could use that but you're going to have a lot of machine time then plus that component is going to be used for the flywheel so week number one we didn't saw up a specific piece of material for this crankshaft component this disc so we we have a tray full of little slugs of material. They're generally between four and six or seven inches long and they have a specific diameter to them. We'll have to know what that diameter is. So if I go back to the drawing, the drawing tells me that the diameter, the biggest diameter, is 630 thousandths. Well, if I go over to my decimal equivalent chart, I can go to the decimal equivalent chart and look for something that measures 630,000 so that I know the size of material that I need to order. Okay, if I had to make thousands of these, I need to make sure I place the order correctly. If I need to turn down the outside diameter, say we started with the one inch diameter, you're putting a lot more labor into manufacturing that component than what's necessary. The outside diameter of this piece is very non-critical. It just needs to be big enough that it holds the pins together, okay? But let's try to sh shoot for a diameter that's going to work out to be within the tolerance zone. Well, if I called up the steel mill and I said, I want six miles of 630 thousandths diameter material, they're going to laugh at you. And they're going to get you to write them a really, really big check. Well, the cost of that material is not going to work out for what we're trying to make here. Okay? 
But if I look on this chart, the closest material sizes that work out are 16 millimeters, which is 629 thousandths and 9 tenths. Well, that works out for my 630 thousandths diameter over here on the drawing. But in a lot of cases, metric diameter stock in the U.S. is sometimes more difficult to get a hold of. So we want to work with a standard inch size. With experience, you're going to figure out what, stock, what sizes of stock are available. So if I needed to buy a piece of material that was four and five eighths of an inch in diameter, they likely are not going to manufacture steel in every eighth of an inch increment. But if I need eighth inch, I can buy that. Quarter inch, I can buy that. Three eighths or half, I can buy both of those. As I get farther along, the spread between the sizes gets much greater. And the availability of an accurate, specific size is going to be more difficult. So there is going to be some turning required. With this project, a material size that works out good is 625 thousandths. Well, 625 thousandths is not the same number. But we have to start thinking about this in relationship of tolerance zones. Again, I did not draw the tolerance zone up here. You can refer to your drawing. Remember, we're on sheet number eight. You can refer to that drawing and see what your tolerances are. So what's the tolerance on 630 thousandths? It's plus or minus 10 thousandths. So that means I can be as big as 640 thousandths or as small as 620 thousandths. Now you need to answer, does the 625 work out inside that range? The answer is absolutely yes. It definitely does fit in. Well, now you have to ask yourself, why didn't the designer just put 625 thousandths? Well, if they did, you look at your tolerance zone, 625 is a three-place decimal, which tells me that I have plus or minus five thousandths now for that size. And I can tell you for a fact that it's not that critical. The diameter does not have to be held within five thousandths. In reality, we could put a special tolerance up here by the 630 and say that it could be plus or minus 20 thousandths, which means I have a 40 thousand spread. That's plenty good enough for this application. But we have the drawings that we've been presented. Okay? So 625 thousandths, or 5 eighths of an inch, is a standard material that you can buy in cold rolled steel. Okay, so now we have our material set up. We have to look at this drawing and figure out which ones of these features can we accomplish using a lathe or a turning machine, right? Remember, a lathe holds the workpiece, the workpiece rotates, and the tool is stationary, all right? So we can obviously do a facing operation, right? We haven't learned about it yet, or we haven't at least seen it during this lab session, but we can put the hole in the center. Putting the hole off center is going to be very difficult for us to do, especially since we've only got a couple of hours exposure to running the lathe. So that offset hole we're not going to accomplish here. Okay, so we're going to do a facing operation, put the hole in, we're going to ignore the offset hole, and we're also going to ignore this quarter of an inch diameter, right, the quarter inch diameter by 20,000 feet counter bore or spot face. That's strictly for clearance, and we're going to do that during the assembly portion of the crankshaft. Okay, 
So all we're going to have is we're going to have a piece that is to some thickness, faced off, hole drilled in the center of it, and I need to make sure that I'm following the tolerance of the center hole. The center hole tells me that I need to be plus nothing, minus one thousandths. Okay? We learned a little bit when we talked about the tools inside of the uh, gray toolbox that there's certain tools that I can expect that are going to hold a good quality tolerance, a good size, a good shape, right? I have to be able to control that. Does a drill bit drill a round hole? If you were paying attention last lab session, you would know that no, it does not drill a round hole. So how can I expect a tool that drills a round hole or doesn't drill a round hole to give me something that's going to be a tolerance of a thousandth of an inch total? That thousandth of an inch is roughly a third of the thickness of a sheet of notebook paper. That's extremely small, okay? So we've decided and we saw there's a tool called a reamer. The reamer we can expect to give us three features of a hole or three characteristics of a hole, if you will, that are important when we're trying to hold good tolerance. And those three characteristics are Roundness of a hole, that's important. If I'm going to measure it and expect it to be very accurate, I need it to be round. Right? What's the second thing? I want it to be good to size. They make reamers in every half thousandths or thousandths of an inch all day long. Okay, you can buy them off of the manufacturing websites. So I got a round hole, I want it to be accurate. And the last thing I want the inside diameter to be nice and smooth. Smoothness on the diameter kind of couples with dimensional accuracy. Because if the smooth, if it's really rough on the inside, it's hard for me to say that it's within the tolerance of a thousandths of an inch overall. Okay? So we're going to go through the steps here shortly on the board before we go to the machine how we are going to accomplish a good quality hole. Lab three, we're holding plus or minus 10. This lab, I'm telling you, you're going to hold something that's 20 times closer than that. Plus nothing, minus a thousandths. Going from 20 thousandths tolerance total to a thousandths tolerance total makes a big difference. So I need to show you the technique and the tools to make that happen. We need to deburr the edge of that hole, I'll show you that. And then lastly, I'm going to take a specialty tool to cut this part off of the end of this stick of material that I've picked up off the workbench. Okay? So I've got 5 8 inch diameter, 4 to 6 inches long, and I'm going to make this little piece on the end. I want to do all the machine work I can to that piece before I cut it off because now I've got this really tiny piece that now I have to deal with fixturing. So we're going to set up and cut this piece off and I'll show you how to set that up. Now the thickness is plus nothing minus two thousandths on the tolerance. Again, that's pretty evil for me to give you a tolerance that's ten times closer than what you held in lab three. And here we are two hours into experience on a machine, okay? So we're actually going to cut this dimension 20 to 25 thousandths big. So now I've got plenty of tolerance because once we press it together, that's when we're going to finish that dimension of the 123 plus nothing minus two, okay? So now I'm going to set up a drawing on the whiteboard of my setup, and we're going to walk through in order the steps that you're going to go through to make this component. So you'll see on the board behind me that what I have set up currently 
is a piece of the 5 8 inch diameter cold rolled steel in the chuck. Again, these are the chuck jaws simulated. All right. This is referring to drawing number eight, the material cold rolled steel with the high speed steel tool gives us a cutting speed of 100 surface feet per minute. At this point in the, in the lab, if you were taking the lab session, we would expect that when you come in, you'll go ahead and grab your key, grab your gray toolbox, because we're going to start using our gray toolboxes now. Go to your machine and try to get it set up so that when the lab session or the lecture starts, you're actually ready to go. So what is expected when you set up your machine is to, number one, lubricate the machine. We expect that every time you come into the lab. So you'll get some of the lube oil and hit all of the detailed um, lube spots on the machine with those little brass pieces with the steel insert inside. It allows oil to get down into that cavity. It doesn't take a lot of oil, and we went through that with you already in a previous video. I would expect that you would load your cutting tool up, okay? Make sure it's oriented in such an orientation that the only thing that's going to touch an imaginary x-axis line, imaginary z-axis line, is the tip of the tool. That tip that we honed that radius on is going to be the only thing that leaves the surface finish at the end of the manufacturing process for that component. Once it's oriented properly, I'm gonna bring that tool over and do my scale trick. We should all be getting pretty good at that. This will be the last time in my lab that you see those imaginary lines set up, okay? certain things that I expect after I show you a couple times that you kind of carry along with you. So I've got this tool set up. I'm going to do my scale trick. I want to make sure that I get it as close to center as possible. Okay? Close to center as possible. So now we're going to back it up. What you're going to notice on a lot of the pieces that we saw cut, it's kind of flat across the end got saw marks on it and deburr marks on the edge, but it's relatively flat. What you're going to see here is you're going to see the remnants of whoever the last student was that made one of these crankshaft discs, okay? So there's the remnants of a drilled hole, and this little conical shaped piece that sticks off is what the parting tool, and you're going to learn about that this lab session, it's the tool that actually cuts the little disc off the log, if you will, okay? So that little conical shaped section is what the parting tool leaves behind, okay? So I want you to kind of understand that. So once we get it set up, we know what our cutting speed is, so we should be able to calculate our RPM from the cutting speed for a facing operation, right? So if I take four times the cutting speed, so this is our formula, right? We'll write it down. Four times the cutting speed, four times 100, which is 400, divided by the major diameter of this workpiece. The workpiece is 625 thousandths. I'm gonna round, so I'm just gonna say it's 600 thousandths, okay? So if I say 400 divided by 0 0.6, I'm going to get 666 RPM. The sixes just keep on going, right? So 666 RPM. I'm going to find the RPM that fits, that works out to be the closest to that 666 within 10% above or below should work out just fine for me. Okay, now I'm going to do a facing operation. Now what do I need for my facing operation? 
obviously I need my lathe tool, I need my cutting oil, and I'm going to need a file when I get done facing that section. But, because of the remnants of this drilled hole that's still in the log of material, I want to face enough off I want to face enough off so that that drilled hole goes away. Well, you may come back and say, well, Mr. Ryan, the hole's already started. Why can't I just use it? Well, you're going to find, depending on how much machine work that you end up doing, that a three-jaw chuck, which is what we use to hold the workpiece, doesn't always run perfectly concentric, okay? Besides the fact that it's not going to run perfectly concentric and the outside diameter of a cold rolled steel piece of material is not perfectly round, if I put a workpiece in the jug, I drill a hole. So I even ring the hole so I know I have a good surface to measure off of and I take it back out and I turn around and put it right back in. If I chuck down on it, your luck may be better than mine, but my luck says that it's not going to go back exactly where it was before. Students use these machines. Novices, if you will, use these machines. If we had a chuck and we took it off the spindle and we dropped it on the floor, it's going to affect the chuck. It may not affect it so much that we can't use it, but it's going to distort the shape of the chuck. It's going to distort where the center line is in relationship to the spindle. I could be traveling around and I'm a novice and I don't pay attention and I actually run into the chuck with my tool. It takes a certain amount of force to make a, to make a cut like that. And it's not going to make a cut, it's going to break your tool. Okay? Things like that happen. You run into the jaws. You get material stuck in between the chuck jaw and the outside diameter of the workpiece. All that's going to affect the accuracy of how well it runs concentric. Not repeatability, but the accuracy of how well it runs concentric. So that's why I ask that you face enough off that you get rid of the drilled hole. You get rid of all this mess over here and the conical shaped piece on the end. We're going to be running at roughly 660 RPM, right? We're going to take depths of cut with our Z axis around 10 thousandths per pass. It's going to take a little bit of time, but it's going to go relatively quick, right? So you're going to take little slivers, there's a 10 thousandths. There's the ten thousandths, there's the ten thousandths. And you're going to eventually get to the point where the whole end of the part is completely smooth, right? So now we have a smooth end of our workpiece. Okay? Remember, the way we actually make a facing cut is we come in and touch and back off. Spindle's running while you do a touch off. Now we're going to take our hand dial back here, right? And we're going to set that dial to zero. Once we set our dial to zero, we're going to move in ten thousandths. So move in, and we're going to face in just past center, and then feed back out just past center because that little center defect I want to make sure it goes away. Now we're going to stop the spindle and take our fingernail and make sure that that center defect is gone. If it's not, it's directly because of the centering process, right? And we also have made sure because we're pros at this point that we have to be running normal rotation. Normal rotation is clockwise from the motor end, lever down, right? This is where your notes are going to start. 
process number one. Facing. Right? Process number two. If we don't know what process number two is, I like drawing these little pigtails and it gives people an idea of what needs to be done. It needs to be deburred. Okay? You do that with the spindle running, the 660 RPM roundabout is where you're going to be doing that. Those pigtails go away. No sharp corners, okay? So now we have the face completed. So now we have to start talking about putting a hole in. This is a drilling operations. There's a tool that we talked about last lab when we went over our toolbox. I'm gonna get rid of that center line a little bit. I'm gonna show you that tool. That tool looks like this. The tip diameter is roughly 60 thousandths in diameter. This is a number two number two center drill. Okay? What did we say a center drill was used for? Well, center drills are very short, very stiff. They actually don't mind cutting at the center because they're ground in such a way that there's not a lot of web or thickness of the center of the tool that just has to plow material out of the way. They actually cut relatively freely, okay? So we're gonna do center drilling. Well, I don't care I don't really care how deep you go. I just want enough of a starting point that when I come in with the drill bit behind it, that the drill bit is going to sink inside that little center and start drilling right on center. If you don't have the center drill and the drill bit comes in and wants to catch off center, have the least resistance, it goes off center and your drill is going to be doing this while it's drilling the hole. If it does that, there's no way you're going to be able to control any kind of size diameter, right? What are we going to hold this center drill in? Everything we've done, we've done with the headstock so far. There's a tool way down on the other end of the lathe that's called the tail stock. It's got a spindle that telescopes in and out. I can control that. And there's a drill chuck that I can put into the taper of the spindle. It does not rotate. It stays stationary. So when I start the spindle and I feed this stationary drill into it, chips start to form. Make sure you're running in forward rotation. Okay? That's the center drill. When I was coming through my apprenticeship, Guys would say, go, when I center drill, drill all the way up the first point. Remember, this thing is a sixteenth of an inch in diameter. And roughly two-thirds of the way up the taper. So this taper, this angle here is 60 degrees for a standard center drill. If I drill that deep, yes, it works. It works very well. But, because that tip is so small, if the chips don't evacuate real nicely, it can grab that little tip and break it off. If it breaks it off and you're inside of a very valuable piece, we're not here, so it's not that big a deal, but if you're inside of a valuable piece that you're trying to make an adjustment to, you have to get that tip of that center drill out of the part. You only have to dig a center drill tip out 
of a piece one time before you say, you know what? I don't think I have to drill quite as deep. Okay? Before I center drill, I have to figure out my calculation though. Okay? My calculation of RPM. What's the biggest diameter that I'm going to be machining with? It's not the 5 8 inch diameter when I'm drilling. It's the 60 thousandths tip on it. Okay? It's that 60 thousandths tip on the drill. So my calculation is 4 times the cutting speed, 400, divided by 0 0.06. Okay? That's over 6,000 RPM. That's a pretty fast spindle. The spindles up here only run to about 1,200 RPM. They don't run to ultra-high spindle speeds. So you have to be concerned about that. So where are we going to run at? We're just going to run at our maximum spindle speed. There's going to be a lot of tools that you use over time, if you make parts, that you're not going to be able to reach the calculated RPM. So we're limited to the output of the machine. I'm not going to run it at 50 RPM because surely I'm going to break the drill down or the center drill. So we're going to run at max RPM. I think, again, up here, I think our, our spindle speed is either 12 or 1400 RPM. Okay? So I'm just going to write here max RPM. My next operation, so reamers don't generate holes. What reamers do is they take and clean out a very small amount of material around the outside edge of an already drilled hole just to clean up the edges and make a nice clean hole. So that clean hole is going to be, what's the characteristics? I want it to be round, I want it to be good to size, and I'd like the surface finish to be good on the inside. So how much material do I need to leave on the inside of the hole? If I go back to my drawing, I can see that the inside diameter of that hole needs to finish at 186 and a half thousandths plus nothing, minus one, okay? So we've got a thousandths of an inch tolerance. But if I take my nominal dimension, the 1865, 186 and a half thousandths, I need to know how much undersize I need to drill that hole. And a good rule of thumb for the sizes that we're gonna be working with is you're gonna wanna drill eight to 10 thousandths undersize. So if I take 186 and a half and I subtract 10 thousandths, I get 176 and a half. I can be within a, about two thousandths of that so that I'm, I'm minus eight to minus 10. So if I go back over here to my decimal equivalent chart, and you likely aren't going to be able to see the numbers on this chart, but I'm going to find something that measures something around the 176 and a half thousandths diameter mark. Well, in this case, a number 16 drill bit is 177 thousandths in diameter. That's within a half thousandths of what I've just done the math to be. Okay? So the next operation we're going to drill a hole. That's a number 16 drill. Typically on a drill bit couple different ways that you can use to decipher what the diameter of the drill bit is. Because if you 
took all the drills in 135 piece set of drills and you dumped them out on the table, you'd have to have a way of putting them back in the right pockets on your drill case, correct? So the quickest way, or the quickest for somebody that knows how to use a pair of dial calipers easily, is to measure the diameter of it. Well, the shank of a drill bit actually measures slightly undersized to the cutting diameter. Why is that? Because that way you're not limited to just the flute length of the drill. You can actually go slightly past. They make aircraft drills. They're 12 inches long. Flutes only on the end. Why would they make it 12 inches long if you can't use some of that shank to drill deeper than the flute length? You can use that length a little bit, okay? It's important that you understand that. But I can take calipers and I can measure over the flute diameter. I'll show you how to do that when we get up to the machine. You're gonna measure that diameter. You may see a thousandth or so difference from nominal or from the actual diameter. Well, why is that? Well, number one, our calipers aren't that good, right? You guys are paying $10 for a pair of dial calipers. The ones I use in my toolbox that I carry around with me are $180 dial calipers. That's more than you have invested in your entire toolbox, okay? So the quality of the measuring tool is going to affect how well you can measure. The quality of the drill bits may affect how good it measures accurately on the outside. Another way that you can figure out what size a drill bit is, is they normally either are stamped or printed, laser printed on the shank. So if you can look at it, my eyes are a little rougher as I get older, but you can typically look at the outside diameter of the shank and say, oh, that's a number 16 drill. As the drills get smaller and smaller and smaller, there's just not enough real estate on the drill shank to put the size. So if you get a small drill bit, and you have a 16th inch drill bit in your set, it's not going to be printed on the outside. You have to measure it. Okay, so we can measure that tool. Again, I'll show you how to do that. Our drill bits are two flutes, so I can measure from one flute to the other and get an accurate diameter. Well, I have to calculate my RPM for a number 16. A number 16 has a diameter of 177 thousandths. We're going to round that puppy. 400 divided by 0.18. You guys need to be able to start doing the math. Okay? As we start going through, what happens is, is we give all the values, people write them down, and once they write them down, it's like their ability to do mathematics goes out the window. That's a big problem for us. Then we have students that once they get to the machine, they come over to us and say, Mr. Brian, Mr. Joe, can you tell me how fast to run this? Guess what? We're going to take a field trip over to the board and we're going to do a calculation together. That way you know how to do the math. Guess what? You ask me again, we're going to take another field trip over to the board. Okay? So it's important that you can be able to do this stuff yourself. It's outside of the 10%, but you could potentially move this to 0.2. Okay, if you want to do the math in your head, if you do it to 0.2, it's 400 divided by 0.2, which gives you 2,000 RPM. Well, guess what? We can't reach that RPM anyway. So what are we going to do? This is our drill bit. What are we going to do? We're going to run the spindle at the max RPM that the lathe will go. Again, we're at 12 to 1400 RPM as fast as we can spin. Okay? 
Now, if I look at that drill bit, and I'm hoping you kind of understand the shape of a tip of the drill bit, but this included angle is either 118 degrees or 135 degrees, depending on what style of drill bit you purchase. Now the advantage is, is we can do some quick math and figure out what the dimension is from the tip of the drill to the back side of that angle. Okay, we need to know what that is. Now why do we need to know what that is? We need to know what that is because my next question for you is how deep do I need to drill the hole? If I need to drill the hole deep enough that I get through the part, do we agree? Absolutely. We said that we're going to part this piece off at roughly 150 thousandths in length. That's going to be our 20 to 25 thousandths over the finish dimension. Write that down if you haven't already. I'd like to roughly cut this piece off at 150. So that's going to be the minimum depth. Plus the drill point, right? Plus another thing that you've not seen yet. This right here is the shape of the reamer. You can see that it doesn't have a big 118 or 135 degree angle. It's got these little chamfered edges, so it just kind of follows the hole and starts feeding in. So the question to you is if I drill the hole to the exact dimension that allows me to part this piece off at 150, can I get the reamer as deep as I get the drill hole? The answer is no. So I would go oversize in depth so that I know I have plenty of good, clean hole. Because when I part this piece off, if that hole through the center doesn't have a precise diameter all the way through, you get to go back to the drawing board and restart this component. Okay? So my suggestion is, we do the calculation, we've got 150 plus this dimension. Well, what is that dimension? That dimension is your drill diameter, 177. divided by three. Okay? So we're going to say what? That's 59 thousandths? No, it's a little bit more than that. If we round it to... If we round it to 180 divided by three, that's definitely 60 thousandths. Okay? So 60 plus 150 gives us 210. I'm going to add another 100,000 to that. That way I know I can get my reamer deep enough. Okay? So I would say we would just go to 300 or 350,000 in depth. So we're going to drill. I'm going to say Z minus 0.35. That'll give us a depth. And that's when the tip of the drill touches the part, set the dial on the tail stock to zero. One revolution to 100. So it's one, two, three, and then a half turn. That'll give us a hole It looks like this. Plenty deep enough. Okay? Drills have two flutes. So the two flutes, even though they're evenly distributed, they're at zero, 180 degrees, they like to kind of walk around a little bit. Why is that? 
If you ask yourself why, it's because if those two flutes are not ground by the manufacturer exactly evenly, if the material doesn't tear and cut exactly evenly, your forces change. The forces change and it forces that drill to kind of be all over the place. It's still roughly on center, right? But it's not a great hole, okay? What a reamer has in store for it, our reamers that we use in this lab, the small ones, smaller than what we're using today, have four flutes. And the ones we're going to use today are six flutes. Well, now instead of having just two flutes evenly distributed, I've got this spider web of flutes that's keeping me centered up inside the hull. That keeps it from jumping around and gives me a nice, precise hull diameter. Okay? So, number five on our steps is going to be to ream. Now, we have to determine what diameter reamer we want to use, okay? There are there are five different reamers in your toolbox. I'm going to write out what those diameters are. These are for the offset hole in this crankshaft that we're going to get to in a later lab. They are the five sizes. Well, the nominal size three sixteenths, give or take, okay? 185 and a half is under three sixteenths. 188 and a half is over. So one of them is going to be a slip fit, which means I should be able to take a three sixteenths pin and it slip in. And then the other one's going to be a press fit, which means if I drill and ream that hole and I take a three sixteenths pin, in order to get it to go in the hole, I've got to push it in and displace material so it presses inside that hole. 3 sixteenths in its decimal form is 187 and a half diameter, okay? So it should be obvious to you that the point .1855 is gonna be your press fit And your 1885 is going to be your slip fit. Now, what else do you see about the relationship between those two sizes? They're only three thousandths difference in diameter. Three thousandths is about the thickness of a sheet of notebook paper. So if, I'm, if I have both of them sitting down on the table, it would be pure luck picked up the right one, right? So there's two ways to determine which one of those reamers are the proper size. Number one, laser engraved on the side of the shank is the diameter. A lot of times these reamers get pinched on and then they spin in the chuck and that laser engraving goes away. Sometimes they're not printed very dark and old guys like me can't see it. Okay? So if I can't read the size on the side, I have to take my calipers and measure. Well, it's got two flutes at three different spots. It's a six-fluted tool, but they're opposing flutes on all three orientations. 
so I can measure that. I'm going to show you an easier way to measure that diameter once we get up to the machine. But I want you to look at the side, double check with your caliper measurement to make sure I've got the right size ramer. And the ramer that I'm going to select is 1855. Well, you may ask, why am I using a 1855 reamer when the dimension clearly says that it's 1865, 186 and a half thousandths? Well, it's possible that a reamer could cut oversize. So if I take the nominal dimension on my drawing and I go all the way to the bottom of the tolerance zone, which is 1855, that's the size reamer that I'm using. That way, if it does ream oversize, I've got a whole thousandth of an inch for it to ream oversize, and the part's still good. Okay? The part's still good. So we're going to ream. I'll repeat that diameter size. Diameter. 1855. How deep do I need to ream? I'm going to say Z minus 0.2. Once it comes in contact with the material, I'm going to go another 200 thousandths deep. I've drilled 350 thousandths deep, so that gives me plenty of clearance. Once you start holding these tools in your hand, a drill bit has a helical flute, right? That helical flute, as it's spinning, pulls the chips up out of the hole. A reamer, the ones we use in here, have straight flutes. But well, with the straight fluted tool, where do the chips go? Well, the chips have two options. They either stay in the flutes, which there's only so much room there for them to stay in. Some might kind of smudge out the outside, and some's going to smudge out on the inside and go into the bottom of the hole. So I need to make sure there's enough of a cavity that when I go in, it's not going to push on chips or push on the bottom because if I'm driving my tail stock and I push it in, I hit bottom and I keep driving, the reamer's going to bend, force the hole too big, I get to start over again. I don't want to have to start over again. Okay? So we're going 200,000 steam. My RPM, I said, was 2,000 RPM ish, right? I'm rounding things. If I'm at 2000 RPM and I ream, the reamer has six flutes, the drill bit has two flutes. The more flutes that are engaged, the more chance you have of getting chatter. If you don't know what chatter is, you may very well learn about it very quickly up here. If you're running too fast for the tool in relationship to the material that you're cutting, you're going to get a high-pitched squelching noise. It's not pleasant. The bigger the tool, the worse the noise. Okay, the faster the RPM, the worse the noise. Well, what it does is the tool sits there and jitters around and makes this awful noise. Well, as it's jittering around, what do you think it's doing? It's making the hole too big. Make the hole too big, get to start over again. So I've got three times as many flutes. Good way to remember. Three times as many flutes, 2,000 RPM for the drill bit. I'm going to divide by three to get my RPM for my reamer. So all I'm going to say here is RPM divided by 3. So that's your calculated RPM divided by 3. When we get to the smaller reamers that only have four flutes, 
you can theoretically divide by two, and because you've only got four flutes, it actually still cut really nice for you. As we move forward, you're going to see drawings very similar to this. Set a drill, drill bit, reamer. You have to understand the geometry of each one. You have to understand how to measure each one. How to calculate the RPM for each one. But at this point in the game, we're done with the tail stock. The tail stock we're finished with. Okay? So in reality, you should have A hole in the end of the part that looks like this. A drill hole to a certain depth. The ring hole is just shy of your drill depth. And there may be some chips kind of jammed down in the bottom because that's where the chips went. Right? When we pull the reamer back, we have this little tool, and I'll show you when we get to the machine, it's called a go-no-go -no -go gauge. It's got specific gauge pins, one on each end, that's going to allow you to inspect that diameter. The go side, which happens to have a green collar on it, should go in the hole. That means that it's big enough. The red side has a bigger pin in it. Again, it's got a red collar on it. That's called the no-go side, you should be able to flip that around and that pin not even start in the hole. If it goes in the hole, I'll let you guess. Okay, I'll give you another second. You get to start over again. The hole's too big. Okay? A couple things could have happened. It may have chattered, wobbled out a bigger hole most likely thing that happened is you picked the wrong reamer. You come up and say, well, Mr. Brian, I, I did it exactly the way you said. I don't understand. I'm going to say, well, let me see the reamer. The reamer is the big one. Okay. Explaining to me how you think you did it isn't going to be enough for it to magically appear. You get to redo the part. Okay. It needs to be able to press together once we start assembly. Okay? Which is going to be one of the next labs. So we've got this going on. What do we need to do? Got these little pigtails, right? What does that mean? That means that we have to deburr the edges of the hole. Well, we can't get a file down inside the hole. I guess we could, but we'd have to buy more files, little teeny ones. When we were going through our toolbox, we said there's this tool called a countersink. It's 82 degrees included. We have some 90 degree ones, but you can actually take and push it up there with your fingers without the machine on and spin it inside the hole and it chamfer the inside of the hole for you. There's six fluted, so it only takes a part of a revolution to get the burr off. If you're not pushing hard enough, you may have to spin it a couple times. But one or two quick spins, it should be burr the edge of that hole. This is our countersink. So I'm going to say, after we ream, Item number six, or step number six, is deburr with your countersink. Deburr countersink. Okay? So now we've got the deburring done. We've got a little chamfer on the edge of that hole. Now we have to set up to do a parting operation. The parting operation, 
what the parting operation does is it takes the piece and cuts it off. Now how thick did we say we want to cut that off? We said that we would like to cut it off at 150 thousandths thick. If I wanted to, a tolerance on that 150 thousandths, I would like it to be 150 plus 10 minus nothing. Because if it gets too small, when we press them together, you can start running into problems with it being too thin. Okay? So 150 thousandths plus 10 minus nothing. So you're going to pull out of your toolbox, and we're going to show you that when we get up to the machine. There's a tool that's a high-speed steel blade long and skinny. The ones that we purchased are I think an eighth of an inch in thickness, maybe three thirty seconds, but we'll double check that once we get up to the machine. We'll just assume they're an eighth of an inch thick. Okay? Now this semester we've purchased some carbide indexable ones. You're going to be the first folks to see the carbide indexable ones to get used. But just for visuals down here. I'm going to show you what a parting tool looks like. Okay, the carbide indexables are just stronger, um, should cut nicer. Um, they have a, they're an eighth of an inch thick here, right? We've ground a slight angle on them. Okay, if I were going to use a knife and slice a piece of bread off, and here's my knife, if I was going to slice a piece of bread off, would I want that knife to be angled one way or the other? I angle it like this and push into the board? No. Angle it like this and push into the board? Not going to happen. I want it to be good and straight with the groove I'm trying to cut, right? So what we're going to do is we want the edge of this blade and its ground nice and straight to be parallel with the face of the workpiece. Okay? So I'm actually going to bring that blade up loosen the nut on my tool post. I'm going to bring the carriage and the cross slide up until I can just bring the edge of it up to the side of the workpiece because this face surface represents the straight line axis of the x-axis. Okay? So once I get it straight, I'm going to lock my tool post down. That big nut up here on the top, I'm going to lock that down with the big wrench. That way it doesn't move. If this tool is not straight to the machine or straight to the x-axis, you're going to cause a lot of heat. You could break the parting tool, but you're definitely going to cause some issues to your workpiece. And if you cause issues to your workpiece, that means that it's going to give you problems as we start assembling things. Okay? So once I get the blade set up, that parting blade set up parallel to the axis, I'm going to bring my right side, I'm sorry, my left side of the parting tool blade up until it just touches the face of the part. So I'm going to lock my carriage in and I'm going to feed with my compound while the spindle's running until it just touches the face of the part. So I say while the spindle's running, well how fast do we want to run the spindle? There's not really a calculation that I can give you for that, but experience tells me, we're going to say parting, experience tells me that we're going to want to be between 300 
to 400 RPM. Okay? 3 to 400 RPM. That's going to give us the nicest, cleanest cut. So once we come up and we just touch, and then we pull it back, okay? We're going to pull it back. So the left edge of that tool is going to be in line. So we pull it back with cross lock, big handle in front of it, smaller than the two big ones. Okay? We're going to take our dial, right? We got our dial. We're going to set it to zero. We've got our hand wheel here. That way you can see what's going on. Now we have to figure out how far we move back to accomplish the 150 thousandths dimension. The first thing that we do is we're going to move back Z minus the thickness. T. Well, that Z minus is 0.125. If you're not sure of that dimension, measure it. When we get into the carbide indexable one, we're going to have to measure it because I don't remember offhand what thickness it is. Okay? Generally, carbide inserts are made in metric sizes, so it may be a two and a half millimeter. Two and a half millimeters, really close to 100 thousandths, low to 98 thousandths. So we're going to move back 125, okay? What does that do? That puts the right side of the parting tool, the point, flush with the front surface. That's only part of my job. My next part of the job is reset your dial to zero and move back 150. Fifty thousandths. So what does that do? That takes my parting tool blade. And puts it right in line with where I want to do my parting operation. Remember, three to four hundred RPM. We're going to start the machine. Well, let's back up a second. You notice that the edge of the parting tool, the front edge of the parting tool is angled. Can you think of why it might be angled? It's angled because when I part the piece off and I go just right when I'm ready to go into the hole and the piece fall off, I want it to part off and actually break through first on the right side so that none of this other stuff back here is stuck onto the back side of that wafer. If it's stuck, I have to figure out how to get it off of there. So if you recall, remember this shape, that conical shape? That shape comes from this blade going in, this is the angle, parting off on the piece, and now when it comes off, it's clean. We could easily do this, right? We can part all the way through. I'm going to show you a quick little trick. If we go in only part way, so I'm going to take my blade, and I'm going to go in part way. Right? That's going to give me a shape that kind of looks like that. Okay? And then I'm going to back my parting tool back out. Once I back my parting tool back out, there's a burr hanging right here. That little burr, I need to get it off of there. So I'm going to stop my parting operation. I'm going to take my file, and I'm going to deburr that corner. I want to get that burr off there. That burr needs to go away. If you're taking my lab class, the, lab, the burr needs to go away 
because that's what you're going to get graded on. The absence of burrs is what you're going to get good grades for. So I need the burrs to go away. All right? So I take my file and I deburr it. What's left to do? Start the machine, part the rest of the way off, and now this little penny-shaped piece is going to fall down. You might want to give it a second before you grab it. That little penny piece, that little disc, gets hot. Especially if your tool's not set up just right. Okay? So it gets really hot. Let it cool off a little bit. I have an advantage. I can put it in my hook, blow it off with the air hose, and now I don't have to worry about how hot it is. Okay? So let that thing fall off. We're done with the workpiece. Take it out, clean it up, put it back in the, in the center workbench so that the next person can use it. That little disc, the only thing left to do is check it for burrs. You're probably going to have to hold on to it. You might have to put in a vise and take your countersink and countersink the back side of it because that's the only feature that we haven't been burred yet, right? Once it does, I'm going to take my go no go gauge and I'm going to make sure it goes all the way through the green side. I'm going to make sure that the red side doesn't start either direction. If it starts either direction, you have to bring it to one of us and say, is this still going to work? And only in a very small percentage of time can we make it work. In most cases, you're going to have to go back to the drawing board and remake it. Okay? That piece is completed until we press it together and finish machining it, okay? We're going to do that in another lab or so. Once I get things cleaned up down here, I'm going to meet you folks up at the engine lathe, and we're going to go through the demonstrations of both the chamfering and the manufacturing of this crank disc. Okay, so we're going to do our operation for our chamfering. And here's the workpiece that we had from lab number three. If you remember, we did our facing operation and deburring. So we're going to work on that piece. The components that you have to chamfer are item number five and item number 11. The other piece that you did, which was item number six, which is the piston, is a quarter of an inch in diameter. We do not want to chamfer the pistons. But these 3 16 diameter we are going to chamfer. So I'm going to take my chuck key, I'll size my chuck so that that workpiece will sit in, and I'll lock my chuck down. If you recall, we've talked about the stick out from the face of the chuck to the end of the workpiece. If that gets extended out too far, it becomes very flexible. So we want to keep that to a minimum down below two to two and a half times the diameter and ratio. Okay? So now we're going to set up our lathe tool. That's our right-handed facing and turning tool. And I believe that I have that tool set pretty well to height. But we're going to go ahead and double check and make sure that the tip of that tool is on center, the center line of the main spindle. Remember that this nut here allows me to rotate that tool. We've talked numerous times about making sure that the rotation of the tool is right when we do our centering operation. So here's my six inch scale. We're gonna put that guy in between put that guy in between the tip of our tool and the workpiece, the cylinder of that workpiece. So when I pinch that, what I'm looking at is how vertical it is to the ground. Well, the ground surface is this surface of the cross slide, okay? We had our 
combination square set up like this so that we have a reference that we can look at and see how good that is set up and it looks pretty good to me remember during the board work of this lab session I talked to you about if I had a choice of whether I'd want it to be a little bit high or a little bit low because I'm not cutting to the center line of the part I would prefer it to be a touch low now in this case I'm pretty well right on the center line so we're going to leave it as is I'm going to take the scale out remember on the part drawing we have a dimension two times so it's on both ends 30 thousandths by 45 degrees okay so we have to have a reference that we can set that 45 degrees remember we're going to be on the back side of the workpiece back side of the spindle so you need to start thinking about the things that are critical when we're on the back side of the spindle we want to rotate so that the leading edge of the tool is at 45 degrees to the part itself well the part is so small and short that it's not easy for us to reference and use that as a reference surface so what i've done is i've taken my combination square head apart right this is just the aluminum component of the combination square i've stuck a magnet in it because i need to be able to work on the machines with just one arm right so i'm going to set that like so remember we talked in previous lectures that there's nothing on this machine that was made by mistake so the center line of the spindle parallel to the z-axis or the ways the face of that chuck is perpendicular to the center line of the spindle so if i use the face of that chuck as reference I can bring my tool up and I can line up the leading edge of the tool with that 45 degree angle. Okay, I'm going to make sure that you can see that. 45 degrees, leading edge of the tool. Once I get that set, I'm going to lock that down. If I look at the tolerance on the part drawing for that angle, the tolerance tells me that I have to hold a half a degree. Well, a half a degree is pretty tight. But if I can hold my combination square head up against this surface, it should be relatively easy for you to hold something close to a half a degree. So now I'm going to take that tool, move my cross slide back, far enough back that I'm on the back side of the part. Now one thing that I don't like when I move that far back is you can see that I've exposed the lead screw. Move that handle so you can see a little better. But there's a window here that has opened up. So if I take this blue towel and this is just what I like to do. I'm going to cover that hole up so that when any oil or chips start flying around, they don't go down inside and start giving us problems on that lead screw. Now we've talked about calculating our RPM. Remember, I'm the guy that likes to round things. Okay? So we have annealed tool steel, right? that's a cutting speed of 50. Cutting speed of 50 is 50 surface feet per minute. So the calculation is 50 times 4 which is 200 divided by the biggest diameter that I'm going to be cutting. Well the largest diameter I'm going to be cutting is 0.1875 or 3 16 of an inch. So I'm going to round that to 0.2. So what we're going to say is 4 times 50 is 200 divided by 0.2. That gives me an RPM of 1,000. 
Now in the previous lab, we actually ran at 840. So 840, if I look at the chart on the front of the headstock, this is the headstock. 840 is black and medium. So I want to make sure I'm going to, I'm going to move one handle at a time, right? And if I can't get it to go in, I have to rotate the chuck. Once I rotate the chuck and I think that I have my, my shifters in gear, I should be able to feel a belt moving because this is a belt drive machine. To confirm, I'm going to hit this green button on the face of the headstock just to jog it. As long as it moves, it's in gear. If it sits there and kind of thrashes and sounds like something's not right, you haven't hit the gears yet. Because we're on the back side of the spindle, we've got our RPM set up. I'm going to get my cutting oil down here. Because we're on the back side, if I run in normal rotation, which is taking this lever and pushing down, normal rotation, remember, is clockwise from the motor end of the spindle, okay? That means that the material's gonna come up on the underside of the tool. Well, that's not the cutting edge. The cutting edge is on the top side. We have a positive rake angle that allows the material to flow really nicely. So we have to run the spindle in reverse rotation. These are the only features on the lathe that we run the spindle in reverse rotation. So after this, we're gonna go back to forward rotation. So to get on reverse rotation, I'm gonna take this red handle and I'm gonna pull up on it. I'm at a thousand RPM. I've got my carriage locked in place. Okay, now I'm going to take my compound and bring it in until I just start to cut some metal on that back corner. Now I saw a little bit of fuzz of metal starting to cut. So at that point, I'm going to take my dial here. Notice that I'm not turning the hand wheel. All I'm doing is rotating. Sorry about that rotating the dial right i want to make sure that the handle doesn't move and we can retouch that off if we need to we're going to do that while it's running i'll double check that when i start the machine back up once we do a touch off and we've zeroed our compound dial we're going to put some cutting oil on it and the distance is 30 thousand so we're going to move back 30 and then come off the cut okay if it does not cut freely if the part starts to turn darker colors you want to stop okay we've got something wrong so let's go ahead through this cut i'm going to demonstrate this twice so it becomes very clear to you how we go about doing this reverse rotation <laughs> start seeing material cut, I'm going to set my dial to zero. A little bit of cutting oil. I'm going to feed in 30 thousandths. And then back right back out. Now we'll shut the machine off. If I unlock my carriage, I can move in a more coarse fashion away from the, the spindle. Remember, we don't stop the chuck from spinning with our hands. I'm going to take my fingernail and make sure that I don't see a burr, right? Now that I've got that feature cut, I can go ahead and take the part out, give you a better look at that. Hopefully you can see that. But that's a 30 thousandths by 45 degree chamfer. If you saw how much cutting that was, that's basically all I expect of you. So now we're going to spin the part around and do the opposing end. Same thing. No more than two or two and a half times the diameter and stick out. I'm going to go ahead and take wipe those chips off.
bring the carriage up. I'm going to lock the carriage down. Remember, reverse rotation, so we're going to pull this lever up. Once I pull it up, I'm going to bring the tool in with the fine feed. Got a little bit of chips there. Set my dial to zero. A little bit of cutting oil. doesn't get any easier than that. Now if while you're cutting that chamfer it takes a fair amount of force for you to drive the tool up into the spindle, there's something that's going wrong. Either your tool is potentially too high, that could be a problem. Another thing that could be the problem is that possibly you're not pulling the lever up to run the machine in reverse rotation. I don't have any burrs. That 135 degree angle from the flat to the angle should be nice and burr free right out of the box. Okay? So this component is completely finished until we get to the mill. Once we get to the mill, we're going to take and machine a flat on it but that's several sessions down the road. So that concludes the chamfering, and now we're gonna go ahead and get set up with the crankshaft disc. Okay, so what we're gonna work on now, we just got finished our chamfering operation. We're gonna work on that crankshaft disc that we talked about earlier in front of the whiteboard. That drawing number is item number eight, and that's on sheet number eight. It's going to be difficult during this video series for me to always have the drawing in front of me. I have it magnetized to the back side of the machine so I can see it, but you're going to have to have yours in front of you so you can reference it. Feel free to take notes on your, your part drawing as well so that you kind of keep a chronological order of what's going on. We should already have that but for future reference. So I'm still set at this 45 degrees. What I'm gonna do is rotate that tool post around so that I'm sitting more natural for a facing operation, okay? Now I'm gonna lock that tool post in. So now it's not gonna go anywhere. Make sure that this lever is tightened down. Pretty much any time we're doing a tightening operation, whether it be with a chuck key or with a wrench, we're tightening clockwise, loosening counterclockwise. If you recall from yesterday, these cam locks that hold the chuck on, tightening is clockwise, loosening is counterclockwise. It may feel like it's holding the chuck on going counterclockwise, rest assured it's not, okay? So we're gonna do a facing operation. If you remember when we talked about our workpiece, we're picking this up and expecting that the workpiece has already gotten some machining done on it by the student previous to you. So there's that tapered section. The tapered section is a direct, um, direct response to a parting operation. That's why you get that kind of funnel. And then you also get the hole in the center. And we've already talked about why we don't use the existing hole. Okay, now because I'm the instructor, I actually have a new piece of material. Um, it's saw cut on the front face, 5 8 diameter, no more than two to two and a half times stick out from the face of the chuck jaws. But I need enough real estate there that, so that I can work on the part. I don't want to get into a pinch point, right? We talked about that yesterday. A pinch point is anywhere I can put a piece of my body that I can expect that it's going to either get grabbed, pulled, or pinched in the machine. Got my tool oriented, and we have to back up and do our calculation for RPM. This is different than the calculation. The numbers are different than what we did for the small shafts, the 316 shafts. 
Number one, this material is cold rolled steel. It's also referred to as low carbon steel. Okay, low carbon steel has a cutting speed of 100 surface feet per minute. So we're going to do our calculation. 4 times 100 is 400 divided by 0.6. Because I take the 625, which is 5 eighths, which is what this rod measures, I'm going to round it. I round it just to make my life easier. Okay. So 400 divided by 0.6 comes up to something around 666 RPM. Well, if I go over to the headstock of the machine, the RPM that's closest to that 666 is my 640. That tells me I have to be on red and medium. So I'm already on medium, so I'm gonna rotate that other lever to the red all the way down. Make sure I'm turning some belts. Jog the machine. I'm actually ready to do my facing operation. So I'm going to coarsely adjust, get my tool up close, lock the carriage in. It's my carriage lock. When I start the machine, I'm going to come up and touch the face of the part, and then I'm going to back off. Once I back off, I'll set my dial to zero and feed in my first facing pass. We're ready to go. Take this lever, push down on it for forward rotation. I'm going to feed in until I just see the tip of the tool start to cut some metal. You saw that chip. So now I'm going to back back off, set my dial to zero. Put a little bit of cutting oil on it. Feed in ten thousandths. And now I'm going to face to the center. And just the tiniest little bit past center. And now I can feed back. Done one facing pass. So now when I stop the spindle, I should be able to run my finger across the front face, check it with my fingernail, make sure that there's no center artifact. That center artifact means that the tool is either too high or too low. We've already discussed this. If you have issues, get one of us instructors and we can come over and give you a hand to get that sorted out. So I want to machine enough off that I get rid of any chamfer or any marks, right? All that funnel, that tapered section, has to go away. I want it to be good and smooth across the face of the component. That makes sense. We're going to go ahead and take one more facing pass. Start my machine, feed in another ten thousandths, and now I'm going to feed in and just the tiniest little bit past center. Once it goes past center, feed back out. And I'm going to stop the machine. We've already checked, there is no center artifact. The advantage right now, if I feel confident, that I face the component off. I'm gonna lock that, unlock that carriage. If I start my machine, I can take and file that edge. I wanna get the burrs off. Remember, hold the file handle in my left hand and support the end of the file with my right hand. Start the machine. I'm gonna start basically flat, right? And I'm gonna roll that file up around the corner. I'm in contact with that corner the entire time. And that corner is now deburred. Okay? So now we're going to move this carriage up and out of the way. I'm back about as far as I can go. Let me get this tool up and out of the way. I'm going to take that tooling block off completely just so you can see. 
I think what you found or what you see now, I'm gonna move this back so that the filming can actually see a little better. We added that blue towel underneath because it seems to give you a little bit better contrast when we're videoing and getting some close-up shots. So if you look at your notes, you're gonna see that our next operation is to get that hole put in there. So this is our center drill. I'm gonna make sure you can see that. That's our center drill. That's what we're gonna use to get a, a feature on the face of the part so that when we start drilling, it hits that spot and takes off drilling from there. This is our first time using the tail stock. And in the tail stock, there lives a drill chuck. This is a drill chuck. It will hold up to a half inch drill bit down to something under a 32nd of an inch. On the back side of the tape of the drill chuck, there's a shank. This is what's held on. If you look at it, you can see that it's got a long slender taper. That long slender taper works out to be something around three quarters of an inch taper per foot. That's called a Morse taper. Morse tapers allow us to take this tool and put it in a female side. This is the male side of a Morse taper. If you look inside the tailstock spindle, there is the female side of that Morse taper inside. So if I put the, tail, the Morse taper in, it doesn't seem to want to go. Well, if I telescope that tailstock spindle out just a little bit, I'm going to lock that tailstock in, and I kind of pop it in with a little bit of pressure, now it's in there. It's not going anywhere. The reason that it wouldn't go in before is if I bring the tailstock back far enough, on the end of the screw, it pops that taper apart so it, we can take that tool out. We can actually put several different tools in that tailstock. So remember that. If it doesn't go in, you have to telescope the spindle out a little bit extra, put it in with a little bit of force. It's not going to go anywhere. This is all done with the tailstock lock. This is the lock. So it locks the tailstock from moving on the ways, right? All I've done is pulled it down. Now if I try to slide it, it's not going to go anywhere. Okay? Also keep in mind that the spindle or the quill, this is the quill of the, of the tailstock, it's not infinitely long. I think we can agree to that. It's only got a certain amount of length. The screw that drives it only has a certain amount of length. So if you keep turning this and turning this and turning this, eventually the screw that's attached to this hand wheel will come out of the back side of that spindle. If it comes out and you, have, you take this spindle out and hold it in your hand, I'm gonna come over give you a couple few choice words and I'm gonna to have to put the thing back together it only has a certain amount of travel to it okay so I want you to get accustomed to how much travel there is Again, this is my lock there's another handle down here that lever that locks the spindle from moving we're not going to use that lock during this demonstration Matter of fact, we don't use that lock throughout making the air engine. That's for when we use live centers. So I want to slide this back and forth. I'm going to take my center drill now. See this knurl, that crosshatch pattern that gives it a texture? It's called a knurl. If I rotate that clockwise, it will tighten these jaws on the chuck down on that center drill. The center drill is now tightened down in the chuck almost as though it was a component 
that's made to the chuck now, right? It's not going to spin. It's not going to go anywhere. That is a, this is called a keyless chuck. They're made much more precise than a standard drill chuck that you may find in your grandfather's wood shop on a drill press, say. Okay? So I'm going to bring the tailstock up, and I want the tip of the center drill to be close to the workpiece. Now, if you look at your notes, the notes tell you that all I want to do is make a small indentation on the face of the part. It's going to be on center because the alignment of the tailstock is precise both front to back and up to down, up and down to the center line of the spindle. So it's going to give you a nice centered up hole. It is not perfectly lined up. Okay? A human being did this. So there's going to be some sort of an error to it. We want to make that small indention so when we start the spindle we're going to come up and touch the face of the part and I'd like to move in around 30 thousandths. 30 thousandths is going to be a good spot depth for our center drill. But if you look at your notes you're going to see what RPM we've calculated and we did some calculations and I think the number worked out to be really something terribly big. And this machine is limited in RPM. It only runs to 1400 RPM. So because the calculation worked out to be something terribly fast, like five or 6,000 RPM, we're gonna go ahead and run it at the max RPM of the machine, okay? If we run, the slower we run it, the more chance we have at breaking that tip off. And we've already discussed the fact that you only want to break a center drill off once before and have to dig it out of an important part before you learn how to effectively use a center drill. So I'm going to go over here. The headstock tells me that 1400 is black and high range. So high is on the center on this right lever. So black and high, black is all the way down. Now I'm going to jog. So this is going to be pretty fast, okay? 1400 RPM. So I'm actually ready to take that cut. First, I'm going to put some cutting oil on it. The depth of my center drill hole is really not terribly critical. If I start the machine, I'm going to take this red lever and push down. And when I come up and touch, I'm going to feel it with the resistance of my tailstock hand wheel. Now I'm going to feed in something close to 30 thousandths. Back, back off. I'm going to take my tailstock and back it away. Okay. Now that we've got that backed away, I've got that indentation on the face of my workpiece. I told you in the lecture portion that we needed to be able to measure drill bits and we need to be able to measure reamers. Now these calipers, this is actually a more expensive than what you have, but not quite as expensive as a carbide face set of calipers. But these are relatively nice. Your calipers, you can't expect to measure anything much more accurate than about a thousandths or a thousandths and a half. The more money I pay on my calipers, the more I can trust them, the more I get to use them and understand how accurate they are, I kind of learn them, if that makes sense. Well, my number 16 drill bit is the next tool. Your notes should tell you that a number 16 measures 177 thousandths in diameter. If you don't have that written down, where are you going to go to find out 
what a number 16 drill bit measures. You're going to go to one of our decimal equivalent charts that we have posted throughout the shop. Well, number 16 measures 177 thousandths in diameter. Okay? Now notice, when I measure a drill bit, because the drill bit has a helical shape to it, right? Kind of looks like a corkscrew that if I measure side to side and my caliper anvils are parallel to the shank of the drill, I'm pretty convinced that I can get a good diameter measurement, right? That's probably the easiest way that you're gonna measure a number 16 drill bit. We also said that the bigger the drill bit, it's got number 16 stamped on the outside edge of it. If for some reason I don't want to measure the drill bit up the length and I need to measure it on the end, I need to make sure that I'm measuring the biggest possible dimension, right? Where the flutes give me the largest dimension. Because if I measure it 90 degrees to where I'm at right now, it's gonna give you the smallest dimension. That is not the whole size that it's gonna drill. Okay? You should feel pretty confident before you drill that hole what size this drill bit is. So I'm gonna mount the number 16 drill in. I've confirmed it's the right size, lock it in. I'm going to bring my tail stock up close to the workpiece. Now, if you look at your notes, you're going to find out, or you're going to see, that we want to drill to a depth of 350 thousandths. Well, your tail stock hand wheel, one revolution is 100 thousandths. So we're going to turn, once we touch, three times and then half a turn. There's not necessary for you to dial that to exactly within a thousandth of an inch to depth because part of that hole you're never, never gonna see, okay? So it's a 177 drill, 350 thousandths deep. We, got, we have to do our calculation. So four times 100 is 400 divided by 0.177. I'm going to round a little heavy, okay? We're just going to call that 0.2. So 400 divided by 0.2 gives you 2,000 RPM. Well, we can't reach 2,000 RPM. We can only get to 1,400. So let's go ahead and run at 1,400 RPM, okay? Let's go ahead and drill this hole. I'm at 1400. I'm gonna put some cutting oil on the drill. And as soon as I come up and touch, I'm gonna remember where my tailstock hand wheel is in rotation. Now I'm gonna start drilling. So, one, two, and a half turn. Notice that I didn't drill lightning fast. If you try to crank real fast, you're going to break the drill bit off. If you don't break the drill bit off, you're not going to drill a very good diameter hole. I'll bring my tail stock back. Take my tool out. Remember, I'm going to use the air hose. Remember, nice and safe operation. Now we have to think about our reaming operation. Remember, the reamer is going to allow us to do something that a drill bit can't do. It's actually three different things, right? 
What are the three things that a reamer can do that a drill bit cannot? Well, a reamer will actually ream a very round hole. Drill bits don't drill round holes. A reamer is also going to give you a nice precise diameter hole. Drill bits aren't good at ho holding tolerance very well. And the last thing is, is a smooth surface down inside of the hole. The smooth surface inside the hole is coupled directly with the tolerance of the hole. If you have a rough surface, it's hard to say that it's tight tolerance. Okay? If it's nice and smooth, now I have a nice and smooth boundary that I can say that is my edge of the hole. Okay? I can measure it more accurately. Well, if I can see, and I don't know that you can see with the video. But a, this reamer has six flutes. And we said the six flutes actually helps for it to generate a good round hole. If reamers were only ever made with two flutes, it wouldn't work as well. Okay? Now, in order to measure a reamer, I'm going to take the flutes that are opposing to one another. I'm looking for a 185 and a half thousandths reamer. If I come in and I measure and I rotate, you see how it quickly drops. That means that I'm going away from the high spot. Now I'm going to rotate towards towards the high spot and I want to make sure that I get a 1855 dimension here, right? I'm at right about 185, 185 and a half. Remember these calipers won't measure much better than about a thousandths. So there's 185. So this reamer is going to be the right one. Remember the other reamer that you have in your gray toolbox that's very close to this size is your 1885. It's only three thousandths difference in size. I can also look at the outside diameter of the shank of the reamer and it's printed on the outside what, di what the diameter of that reamer is. It says it's a 1855. So I'm going to take my reamer and put it in the tailstock. We said that the reamer has twice as many flutes as a drill bit does. I'm sorry, three times as many flutes. So we're going to take our RPM and divide it by three because the more flutes that I have in contact with the metal, the more chance that I'm going to get into some chatter. So if I take my 2000 RPM and I divide it by three, I get something around 660 RPM. Let's go over here to the headstock. We're at 640 is where we want to be. So that's red and medium. So let's go ahead and move my red. Medium is down all the way. Move my wrist around. I'm turning belts, jog it. See, all these things become second nature to you. Now, how deep did we say we wanted to, to ream? Well, I want to ream at least 150,000, so we're going to ream to a depth of 200 to 250. All right, we'll start the machine up, lever down. As soon as I come in contact, hear that squealing? That's the start of chatter. Remember where your hand wheel is, and I'm going to go two to two and a half turns. I want to do that nice and even, okay? When I get to the bottom of the hole, I'm going to stop the spindle. We're going to go one. Now I'm going to stop the spindle. 
Now why do I stop the spindle with the reamer down inside the hole? It's not a lot, but with the machine running, that reamer could scrape the side of the hole and make it just a touch bigger. Well, we're only dealing with a thousandths of an inch, right? We only have a thousandths tolerance on that diameter. So we've got to be careful. not to make the hole too large. Remember, we want to take that burr off of there. So I'm going to take the countersink. I'm going to put it inside the hole and put a little pressure on it and just turn it by hand. Okay? That's all it's going to take to deburr it. So I've put a little bit of a chamfer on there. At this point, we need to inspect that hole. Okay, we're going to take our tail stock and move it out of the way. We're finished with our tail stock. We put that hole in. I talked to you at the lecture board about this go no go gauge. So these pins that are clamped in both ends are precision gauge pins. You can buy gauge pins down to every half thousandths. They also make Deltronic pins that are to every tenth of a thousand. So four decimal places. You can buy one for every size. I know up to two inches. So the green end allows me to put that pin in and we've already pre-sized these pins so that the green end should go in the hole. Okay, the green end is in the hole. So it's at least big enough. Now the red end decides or tells us, it determines whether the hole is too big. So if the red pin goes in at all, it's too big. If it starts to go in, it likely is too big, it's not going to work. So we've successfully put that hole in there, okay? So our last operations are all surrounded into parting. And we have a parting tool set up. These are new to us this semester. These are carbide indexable. You guys should feel very privileged that we allow you to use carbide indexable. Up till now, we have never allowed carbide indexable. But we've had such a problem with parting operations that we're gonna to try to give this, a, give this a go, okay? Now, because these tools stay mounted in this tooling block, we've already set the vertical height. And the vertical height, I mean, let's refer back to our scale trick. Remember taking our scale and pinching it between the tip of the tool and the outside diameter. I would like the tip of this tool to be a little bit too low. That way I know that it's gonna cut nice and freely, right? The advantage with this style tool already locked into the holder, you can't adjust this thumb screw. I'm certain some of you will try. That you don't have to readjust the height. They're gonna be set for your particular machine. Refer back to your notes, you're gonna see that we want to rotate that tool, right? Rotate it so that the length of the tool is parallel to the face of the workpiece. Well, the advantage with this tool is that we can come up and not just the cutting edge, but the entire length of that tool is precise to the straight cutting direction of the tool itself the insert itself, if you will. So we're just gonna bring that up 
and we're going to make sure that this left edge of the tool is touching the entire face okay what I'd really like to do is come up here against the face of the chuck the problem is these machines don't have enough travel to allow me to get the z-axis up far enough to touch that face but that would give me a much larger face to do a precision lockdown on okay once I get it set I'm gonna lock that nut down on the top okay now because these are new tools we may have to adjust our calculations a little bit we said that we're going to come in and we're going to touch the front face with that insert second step we're going to move back this direction the thickness of this cutting blade step number three we're going to move back the hundred and fifty thousandths which is the thickness of the the crank disc that we would like to have when the part comes off okay so we need to know what that dimension is we're going to take our calipers most of your carbide inserts are going to be sized in the metric system okay Two and a half millimeters is just a touch over 98 thousandths. Well, I got a measurement of a little over 99 thousandths. We're just going to call it 100. Okay? I'm going to bring the tool up. I have to figure out how fast I'm going to run the spindle. In our notes, we said we'd like to run between three and 400 RPM. Because these are carbide, I'm going to run at the 400 to 600 range, okay? So my choices are 380 or 640. If you try to push carbide too much at a low spindle speed or a low surface speed, it's going to want to fracture as opposed to cut. It's one tool you're going to run into that just likes to eat metal, okay? It likes to cut. So I'm going to stay at 640. That's where I'm at right now, okay? If we look at the, the manual on these inserts, you could probably run quite a bit faster than that. But we are on manual machines. You folks are relatively new to doing this. So let's, let's take it a little conservative. We're going to start the machine. I'm going to bring the left hand side of the tool up until it touches the face of the workpiece. I don't want to touch too much because I'm then I'll machine a feature on the face, right? I can hear it. Now I'm going to pull the tool back. So the left side of the tool is now flush or even with the front face of the workpiece. I'm going to bring that dial around until it reads zero. Remember the thickness of our carbide inserts a hundred thousandths. So we're going to move 100, one revolution. So now the right side of the tool is even with the face of the workpiece. And now we're going to move back our desired thickness. So that's 150 or one and a half turns. Okay? So we're in position. We locked our carriage well before we started moving that Z axis back. Now when I'm doing parting operations, I like to make sure that the brush with the oil on it stays in contact with the cut the entire time. Okay, so when we start cutting, the brush is going to stay in contact with the, with the cutting operation. So let's start the machine. Lever down. I'm touch the workpiece. Once I touch, I'm going to start feeding in. 
See how nice those chips come off? If you feed too aggressively, it's not going to come off real nice. If you feed too slowly, all it's going to do is generate some heat. We don't want to generate too much heat. If you recall from the whiteboard discussion, we said we'd go about halfway in and we'd stop. Because at this point, I want to go back in and I want to deburr the back side of that disc, the crank disc. I'm going to take my file and I'm going to put it in the groove. Okay? And I'm going to deburr that back corner. Why do I do that? I do that because once this little piece comes off, it's about twice the thickness, but it's roughly about the size of a penny, okay? It's about twice the thickness, so if I take it off and there's burrs on that corner, I have to be able to hold this thing that's really small well enough that I can deburr that back edge. So let's do it while it's still on the log of material. Let me get my brush back out. One other thing I can do while the machine stopped is I can take my calipers and I can measure the thickness of that disc. You should be able to see that I'm within a thousandths or so of the hundred and fifty thousandths that I care about for thickness. So as far as I'm concerned, the thickness is great. Okay, we could adjust that thickness right now while it's still on the log, but I'm close enough. I don't have to be concerned with that. Start the machine, put my brush in contact, and I'm going to come in and start cutting that groove. I want you to remember that the tip of that tool is angled, we drew it on the whiteboard, it's angled so it cuts off that side first, right? And it doesn't leave a little cylinder on the back side of the part that we care about. So we're gonna come in nice and slow now, take that last little bit, and that work piece is gonna fall off. Now normally when I'm teaching a lab, I've got 12 students sitting here ready to help me find that thing. Well this thing tends to get pretty hot, okay? I wouldn't advise losing your arm over it, but I do have an advantage. I can clamp that workpiece in my, in my hand, my prosthetic hand. I don't have to worry about it burning me. There's my workpiece. The only thing left to do, sorry, the only thing left to do is to take that countersink and deburr the back side. Okay? Once I deburr the back side, this part is complete. At least until we do the press fit for the assembly. We're going to do that in about two, se two sessions from now. Okay? Now what that does, after we chamfer or countersink the back side of that hole, that completes session number four.